All right, hello everyone. My name is April Shepherd, and welcome to Lily's Show and Tell series. Lily stands for Lifelong Information Literacy, and we are a group of librarians and information professionals who work to promote lifelong information literacy. If you want to know more about Lily or to join, I have my email address and my Zoom name, so you should be up at top, so you can just email me. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or if you have an idea for a session, you can also email me. Before we begin, I just have a couple of housekeeping items. First, please keep your mic on unless you're speaking. We got a lot of people and you've all been in Zoom meetings by now with someone with the loud dog or something in the background. Um, second, not that I foresee your problems, but just so it's said, please be respectful of others. And then third, I will be moderating the chat. So if you have a question, feel free to throw it in the chat and I'll make a note of it. And we'll do our best to get to every question by the end of our session today. Finally, I also want to thank the Lilly Web Committee. Um, we're a group, small group, and we put together the series. We also maintain the Lilly uh, Web Lib Guides. So thank you for all their work. And now to our speakers. We got two today. So Zoya Falavia, I hope I didn't butcher that too bad. And Stephanie Robertson are librarians from BYU Hawaii, a school representing students from over 70 countries internationally, and they're located on the island of Hua. They're both in the Instructional Services Department and the Joseph F. Smith Library, and they're going to talk about pandemic. So way to you too. All right, thank you so much. Um, my name is Stephanie Robertson here at BYU Hawaii Joseph F. Smith Library on Oahu. And I'm going to go ahead and do the land acknowledgement. Um, and it's important to me to give credit to the verbiage from the land acknowledgement comes from our buddies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where Zoya and I have both graduated from in our programs. So um, I'm going to go and start that now. Aloha, greetings. My name is Stephanie Robertson. I'm a settler on this aina who now calls Laie Hawaii on the island of Oahu home, although I can currently trace my family roots back seven generations to England and various parts of the continental U.S. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the aina on which we gather on the Apua'a of La'ie, um, La'ie Ma'alo, and the Moku of Ko'olau'aloa, which is part of the larger territory recognized by indigenous Hawaiians as their ancestral grandmother, Papa Hano, Hano Moku. I recognize that Her Majesty Queen Liliuokalani yielded the Hawaiian kingdom and these territories under duress and protest to the United States to avoid the bloodshed of her people. I further recognize that Hawaii remains in a legally occupied state of America. I recognize that each moment I'm in Hawaii, she nourishes and gifts me with the opportunity to breathe her air, eat from her soils, drink from her waters, breathe in her sun, swim in her oceans, be kissed by her rains and be embraced by her winds. I further recognize that generations of indigenous Hawaiians and their knowledge systems shaped Hawaii in sustainable ways that allow me to enjoy these gifts today. For this, I am very grateful as a settler I speak to support the varied strategies that the indigenous peoples of Hawaii are using to protect their land and their communities. And I commit to dedicating time and resources to working in solidarity, mahalo. Okay, so Zoya is gonna go ahead and share our slides. Um, and I've got a Google form link I'm gonna share in a minute because we wanna hear from you guys a bit too as we, as we uh, go about today. So maybe while she's sharing the slides, I'll go ahead and put that in the chat now. So if you want to get that ready, that Google form link will take you to something we would like to hear, and it'll be anonymous, of course. We won't we won't publish your names or anything, um, but we'd like to hear your feedback um, for those uh, those items. So we're, today we're going to talk about reimagining libraries to meet the needs of the pandemic traumatized. Um, we are Zoya Follow. Bye, and Stephanie Robertson from Joseph F. Smith Library at BYU Hawaii. Um, so our objectives today, we want to consider a more holistic approach that encompasses blended learning and mindfulness. We want to discuss compassionate listening and flexibility by using strengths-based student-centered frameworks that re-examine how our library services and spaces can support help-seeking self-efficacy and self-regulation. And then finally, uh, in the time remaining, we want to discuss with everyone and review best practices, affirming discussion together, because, you know, we hate the phrase that we keep hearing, this is unprecedented times, but it really truly is. And so um, we're, it, we don't posit ourselves as total experts of exactly what to do, you know, because we're all figuring this out together. So we'd love to link arms with you. 
and discuss and possible workshop ideas for your library. So we'll start with um, mindfulness. Uh, we want to, the first goal, of course, as I mentioned, is consider a more holistic approach that encompasses blended learning and mindfulness. So with our next slide, um, uh, this takes us to a little bit of an activity before we do the form, or if you've already done the Google form, that's okay. Um, but there'll be time later if you haven't though, so it's okay. Um, we're going to consider in the Google form, if you, if you fill up to it, participating and just sharing, shooting out something, it doesn't have to be perfect of how have your students been affected as learners because of the pandemic. I think we're all seeing it. Um, well, we're all noticing it, you know, um, and we may be feeling that way a little bit too. You know, I, um, I'm in charge of the faculty workshops here on campus every week and um, most of which we conduct online. We were doing two in person this semester, but um, the, the topic today for our faculty, we're having a therapist come and talk about, the, it literally says, help, I'm burned out. <laughs> <laughs> how to help educators with their mental health during the pandemic, you know, teaching in the pandemic. And so we're all having this conversation right now. So um, I want you to, I want to invite you to um, go ahead and we're going to do a mindfulness activity. We're going to make space for a little bit of quiet here. If our little book turning there is distracting to you, <laughs> um, you can look, you can take your gaze anywhere in your office or your home or wherever you are right now. And um, this is something that I do with my students to invite a little bit of quiet and a little bit of silence, um, which is so important to the learning process that gets lost sometime, sometimes. So let's go ahead and in our chairs, sit up straight and tall, feet flat on the floor, shoulders back and down, hands resting gently in your lap or the desk or whatever is comfortable to you. Um, and, and yes, our, our instruction is on campus because we had a vaccine mandate for fall. So I do, I do a bit of this in person, we're all wearing masks. So I'm just in my office right now. So that's why I get to be maskless. But anyway, um, and let's just take a minute to invite some calm and some reflection into this time together, because that's part of taking care. If we're taking care of ourselves, we can better assist others, right? And assist the pandemic traumatized students. But what if we're a little traumatized so we can invite three minutes of silence into our day. And that's hard for some of us sometimes. I know that I have ADHD and anxiety that I'm traded for, and it's tricky, but I found this to be something that's really been helpful. So um, I want you to take your gaze to anywhere that you are, a soft gaze. I'm gonna look at the lamp straight ahead at me. Um, and I'm not gonna stare at it really, really hard. I'm just gonna take a soft gaze to it. And with this nice tall posture and rested arms and feet flat on the floor, I'm going to take a deep breath in and out through my nose. So um, if I weren't talking, my, mouth, my lips would be closed and I'd be breathing kind of in the back of my throat, in and out slowly through my nose. I do four counts in. So let's do that together. And if you want to make it sound like the ocean, all the better actually for your, your mind. Neurologically, studies have been done. And this does even three minutes of breathing like this can totally restructure your stress in your brain neurologically. It's really cool. If you want to Google the, the brain scans online, they're there. So let's do that together. Um, and it's going to sound like this. You're going to breathe in for four counts like the ocean, hold for two and breathe out for four. Ready? Begin. Let's do it again. It's weird, but we're doing it together. So we're being weird together. Let's go. And yes, you can absolutely do a variation of this. When I'm doing in a short demonstration like this, I tend to do the box breathing, which is four, two, four, two, you know. Um, but sometimes it's better to, to breathe out longer um, than you breathe in. So you'll find what works for you. But I invite you to do some sort of this breathing as we do this grounding exercise. It's very common in therapy, in CBT or um, other, you know, mindfulness settings. And so with your soft gaze and whatever type of breathing works for you, I want you to ignore the chat for now. I know as librarians, we want to give each other information and we want to get in the chat. We want to talk, we want to do this and that, but I want this time to be just for you, okay? And, uh, and, and so let's, in, let's take a soft gaze. And when we breathe in, I want you to just notice five things that you can see in your peripheral vision. Don't dart your eyes around. Just five things that you can see and just name them without judgment. So for example, I would breathe in 
And as I'm breathing out, I would just name it. As I'm breathing out, I would say like in my mind, lamp, chair, window, rug, yes. You know, just name five things. Okay, so ready? Let's do that. Begin in and out. Just name it in your mind, five things you can see with your soft gaze. Good, and on your next inhalation, I want you to notice four things that you can feel. So I might name without judgment, the seat of my chair underneath my legs, my feet on the floor, the hair that I can feel falling on my shoulders, my back, and my hands touching together. Let's do that, ready? Breathe in. Name without judgment, four things you can feel on exhalation, go. Great, next is three things that you can, um, we're gonna say here at this time. Okay, ready? And inhalation, and then exhale, just name them. Three things you can hear. I hear my um, diffuser. I hear the sound of my voice. <laughs> and I hear a little bit of the air moving in the room. Ready, begin. Go. Three things you can hear. All right, hang in there, you just got two more. On the next inhalation, we're gonna, without judgment, um, two things we might be able to smell. And it's okay to even notice the act of not smelling anything. Um, I can smell the shampoo in my hair, for instance, and I can smell my diffuser. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and do that. In, and go ahead, ocean breathing in. And when you're ready, breathe out and just notice in your mind two things you can smell. last one. And I want to note when you're breathing out, let your shoulders go back and down and relax even further. So our last inhalation is one thing you can taste. I hope it's a good taste. I can taste my two face. It's 8 a.m. here. All right, ready? Begin in. You can taste and breathe out. We're going to do one final breath together just for you. The biggest breath in with your lips closed, back of your throat, and the biggest breath out you can do and on your own timing. But let's do this together. Begin. On your own timing, when you're ready, biggest breath out. Make your shoulders go all the way down. Okay. Thanks for those who hung in there. I know it's unusual, but this grounding exercise, when we're feeling overwhelmed, stressed, whatever it might be, panic attacks, or some of us trying to go to sleep at night, really brings you back into your body instead of in the anxiety of your mind, the future thinking that happens for a lot of us who are professionals um, or just humans <laughs> in a pandemic. Um, and it brings you back into your five senses. Um, and it, it's, it's a good tried and true exercise. So go ahead now. I'll, I'll share the Google form again. If you don't mind moving to um, the Google uh, form and just sharing with us, we'll take two minutes of silence uh, to allow for you folks to um, just shoot out something, whether you've got actual data behind you, like we've dropped by 6% of this or whether it's just, I've noticed this thing. Um, we are interested in anything um, that you've noticed. responses 11 and it's okay to not know there's a second question on there feel free to not answer it yet but you can't if you already did that's okay or if you want to that's fine too um, but a second question we'll talk about later let's get a let's get see if you know One more minute, if you have anything to add, even if it's not sure for you, that's okay. Just to the first question, at least. Stephanie, you're getting a little quiet on us. Oh, 
Can you hear me a little? Okay, now. That's better. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I think I was pushing my <laughs> mic back. Thank you so much. Okay, so before I go on to what I'm going to say on my slide, let me just share a couple of these responses and check in with yourself, reflect, and and consider. Yeah, do I notice this as well? Um, the question is, how have your students been affected as learners? But because of the pandemic, someone just said yes. <laughs> I like that. Like yes, yes, they have. Obviously, <laughs> I, I respect that. Um, honestly, I don't know. Someone said um, less patient, more easily stressed, disengaged. Another, there has been a lack of interest in the library. They become more passive learners. Also, they lost critical study and support space that may have been disproportionately impacted certain groups. Another says they're so overwhelmed. Their depression and anxiety are through the roof. We had unprecedented rate of DFWs this past fall and many of the students expressed the doubt they'd return to college. And then they added ever. Oh, yeah. Um, they feel freer to fit class into their lives instead of fitting their life around class. I've noticed that too. Students have some issues coming back face to face because they'd gotten used to being able to zoom to class from the beach or from doctor's office, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Next response, we'll just read a few more. More irritable, disruptive in quiet spaces. Yes. Um, the biggest problem is often the unknown. They don't know what's gonna happen if their classes will be in person, moved online, if access to services will continue or be altered. That unknown and the constant change is really stressful for them. I think it varies. Some have done well with working independently online and others have found more online and asynchronous work to be very frustrating. Uh, another says, my learners are mostly in essential healthcare professions. Half of those professions had their education accreditation organizations require educational experience to remain mostly in person. They got a firsthand exposure. To, wow, this is okay. Yeah. They got a firsthand exposure to healthcare ethics, professional responsibility, trauma, fear of daily exposure as a student. Their educators are being chronically exposed to healthcare work, asked to bear the weight of students' um, dysregulated emotional experience and adapt their teaching wherever possible to mitigate health concerns is on top of the experience of illness and death that students, staff, and faculty uh, were experiencing daily. So when I started to read that one, I was like, oh, wow, cool. They got the first hand. They didn't have to go online. And then I stopped myself thinking, wait, everyone else, their peers got to like kind of retreat in their pajamas and deal with the pandemic, it, you know, and they, and so, yeah, I, as I read the comment, I'm like, yep. And they, you know, they didn't get that privilege. They got the same uh, stress that, that the healthcare professionals like firsthand, you know, interesting dynamic there. Um, let me just read like three more because these are great, um, challenge. Some are resistant. I think they're disengaging from everything. They don't absolutely have to do in a way they aren't always learning. They're just getting through, but traffic is way down. Energy seems low. Students have increased mental load to bear. Students seem a bit more panicked and unsure of what's expected of them. Sense of disconnect. And I'll just read one more forced to adapt to online learning when that wasn't necessarily their choice. Many have lost family and friends, lost jobs, et cetera, which has also made learning and staying enrolled difficult. And this is from that one was from a community college librarian. So uh, maybe we'll go back to some more because they, they're just so great. Um, and, and so awful at the same time, right? <laughs> so great that we are all noticing these things and, and seeing some patterns because then we're like, okay, we see these common denominators. What are we going to do about it? Which is our topic today. Um, and then, and at the same time, I'm horrified. I'm horrified for them that, and all of us that, you know, okay, we want to protect each other. So we need to stay home, but it's drastically affected the way that we learn. Um, so how do we deal with this? So at our, our campus, because we have been face-to-face -face since fall, um, our students, there was a big, maybe some of you saw us in the news. Um, there was a big pushback because we had a vaccine mandate if they were going to be here and they had to be here in the fall because of the way our accreditation works and because we're such an international campus of over 70 countries here on campus represented um, it was affecting people's visas it was affecting our a lot of things for us so we needed them back so um we had the vaccine mandate and that had as you can imagine a big uproar uh, i think we ended up on fox news um maybe not too unsurprisingly there but um we couldn't offer those online options anymore and maintain some of our important things that we were doing. So uh, our, as librarians, we decided, okay, let's consider, as it says here on the slide, a more holistic approach that encompasses blended learning and mindfulness. We were preparing as a campus for all these things here, considering student ability as a whole student to be able to function in various learning environments, such as our technology, which is our campus LMS, which we use Canvas, some of you use Blackboard, Hawaii has an open access, uh, UH uses an open access um, 
LMS called El Lima. So whatever you might use, we're considering the fact that most of us lived there over the last year. And as an English 101 um, teacher for the for the last forever, um, I noticed that I was teaching more how to use Canvas than English 101 sometimes with my freshman students. So, you know, um, navigating, as one of the comments said, they didn't plan to be online for most of them. They're new freshmen, they're figuring out college, and now they're figuring out all this tech, you know. And some of us faculty members were also figuring it out, um, some faster than others. And then in person meetings now, we have mostly in person on our campus, and maybe some of you do as well. Um, and eventually everyone will, and you'll have to figure out how to get, make this transition like we've been grappling with. Quarantine, our students come from all over the world. And so Zoya and I were talking about the other day how that has greatly affected. Okay, great, we're face to face again. However, half the class is in quarantine. So we're still very blended and very hybrid, which is my last point there, hybrid. How can we mindfully consider not just how our students perform in class, but as a whole person, mind, body, spirit, if there's if there's something's not right with their soul right now because they've been rattled either mental health or just the downtrodden as we've as we've looked at in our our common comments here on the Google form, um, they might be in a, a brilliant student but they're not going to perform well as a brilliant student. If something's wrong with their health because they have COVID or you know they're or we are allowed to have other colds and flus right now <laughs> it seems like oh yeah that exists too, um, you know lots of things going around. Uh, they're, they're just not bringing their whole selves and, and we cannot approach it the same way as many of us are finding that we did before. I've always been a very compassionate teacher in the classroom, uh, a little too jokey with my students, maybe a, a very like friendly and approachable and all that stuff in the classroom to make a really nice environment for learning and discussing and, and all those things. But I've always been very strict in my policies because I found that students rose to the occasion if I required them to be in class, be on time and not turn a late work. I'm now considering a more uh, compassionate approach that we'll talk about next. So Zoya is going to, um, I think that was my last slide for this section, but let me just make sure. Yes. So I'm going to turn it over to Zoya. Uh oh, Zoya, you've got a sound issue. You sound like a, like a Disney mouse or something. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, now? yes, good. Okay, I, I just changed it again. Is this better? Yeah, that's great. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, I was like, oh, I should have checked my sound. Um, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, as Stephanie mentioned, now we're looking at like librarians coming from a place of compassionate listening and flexibility because both of us in our classes, I teach Pacific Island Studies um, and Stephanie uh, says she teaches English 101, English 101. And sometimes we're very um, rigid and we are firm on our due dates and um, our policies for class. And we have to change that um, at this time. We have to be more I guess, empathetic and compassionate towards our students and our learners and um, empathize with them and know that they're going through because we are going through it as well. Um, and as librarians, um, so we were thinking about this when we were planning this um, study and presentation, because it's a study we would like to do. And we're, we're looking at how, you know, as information, um, we teach information literacy and information literacy is not an isolated skill because it correlates and builds upon other competencies and learning abilities like critical thinking, problem solving, metacognition, active learning. And we hear in the literature that, um, it lit, we, when we're reading the literature, it proposes that, you know, the college faculty, the staff, the administration, um, the environment or college, uh, college faculty need to create, um, how do you say, a supportive college culture or an environment that students can grow and that, um, that students can seek for help 
to meet their academic challenges. And we're thinking, oh, well, where is the best place on campus to do that? And the library is the best place. Um, and we are the best people to do it. Because, you know, academic librarians, we, and libraries, we're advocates for lifelong learning capacities. And, I, and we are the ideal professionals and avenues to promote and teach and encourage these different learning skills and constructs. Um, and so that's what we're doing. We're exploring opportunities and way to imagine our library space and um, to include ways to educate and foster and promote. Let me change the slide. Um, I'll come back to this slide. But to promote help seeking, self efficacy, self regulation metacognition, looking at um, strength-based, reflective thinking. And, um, and we would like for you to, to um, ponder maybe how you could promote these constructs and these um, cognitive skills that will maybe, that we're thinking that will help the students with, in, with they're learn so they're not passive learners that will help them be active learners at this time with the pandemic and how to get over being traumatized or with what they're going through. Um, as we mentioned in the big, as we oh, did, we mention Stephanie <laughs> that we want to um, use strength based and student centered frameworks. So this is a framework for learning from our sensor of learning and teaching here at uh, BYU Hawaii. And this is a, um, the student learning process. And we have these attributes like prepare, engage, improve. And, and we don't want, want it just to be up there um, for people to, oh, it's so great that we have this, but we want to make it work, make it practical, apply it. So um, this is part of uh, our, our, how do you say, this is part of what we want to integrate and um, include in this, in this study that we're doing. And um, by using this framework, but building on um, help seeking, self-efficacy, reflective thinking, like, because as for me, I'm from Samoa, and English is my second language. And when I learned, when I um, learned about these um, constructs and these principles, it, I was like, it was an aha moment for me because I wish I knew that in college would have helped my learning, like um, would have helped me like big time. So we wanna uh, promote these and we wanna, um, we want to teach strategies and, 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 and tell students what is, what is self-efficacy, what is help seeking, um, and how does it help you with your schoolwork? How does it help you with learning? Or how does it help improve um, your ability as a learner? And, and we wanna teach those words and give them strategies. Um, so, and to help them, I, that's what I'm thinking, because I wish I learned this when I was a student in college. It would have helped a lot. So this is how we're going to do it. Um, Stephanie and I are still working on it. Um, but we're going to reach out. We're going to promote awareness, do 30-minute workshops on uh, metacognitive, um, what, you know, teaching them what metacognition is, and teach them a strategy. We, we use the, the research reading log. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, the research reading log, but we, we try to teach workshops on um, use this research reading log to make sense of what you're reading. And um, what else? Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, or evaluation workshop. We, we're doing um, the SIFT method or lateral reading. Um, so those kind of types of, of workshops, uh, marketing events, motivational March or no burnout November. We know by March, 
by November. Those are the months the students are overwhelmed and anxious and stressed out and burned out because it's after midterms. They have papers, finals coming up. Uh, they need to catch up. So we could hold marketing events to um, give them strategies to motivate themselves uh, that don't give up, keep going. If you need help, the librarians are here to help you or we can point you, some, point you to a service around um, across campus. They can help you maybe at the counseling if you need to talk to a therapist or that Center for Academic Success if you need help with time management. So marketing events like that. Also posters and flyers. You could put something up like, uh, what is self-efficacy and how can you use this to help you improve your schoolwork? We will also collaborate with other entities on campus, um, working, with Center for, working with the Center for Learning and teaching workshops so we can um, provide workshops for faculty and instructors, because they need to know too, because they're the ones that will, um, that work with the students uh, majority of the time. And Stephanie is um, a part of the Center for Learning and Teaching, which is great because it, we have that advocate for <laughs> the library. But that's, those are some of the, the things that we want to do, um, but including, um, but looking at, these um, learning principles or learning skills, um, like, you know, how, what is metacognition and what is reflective thinking and how can you be a reflect, reflective thinker? And I, I want to tell the students that, I want to tell them what these terms are and what their, the definitions are and then how to do it, how to apply it, how, how to make it work to help them um, in their learning. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, so with this idea, all the great things that Zoya just shared that most of them honestly are things that we have done before. And um, Esther was asking for the reading log, we could always share that too. Um, um, in the listserv or wherever later. But uh, yes, I like I like what I'm reading in the chat too about best practices and ideas around trauma, acknowledging that we've all like even before for the pandemic, people experience trauma, right? And they bring, if you read Bell Hooks and she talks about not disengaging, you know, we're not worried about our students' minds, but um, when they come to class, they might need to use the bathroom. They might need to eat something, you know, like, uh, you know, the whole, the whole student. Um, this is something that there does need to be a bit of a pivot and a shift um, because as much as uh, April and I were talking about before everyone came in today about, you, you read things where people are saying, it's insane that we're all still trying to produce things and go to work and do things at the same level when we're experiencing this collective trauma in a worldwide pandemic, like this is crazy. Let's just stop for a minute and just like be, and, and I, I read those things and I, my, my spirit and my body says, yes, I know, I wanna just be, I just wanna deal with that trauma that we've all experienced. Um, and then on the other hand, I do understand the people who are like, nope, put one foot in front of the other, the things need to carry on as best as they can. So how we find that balance. And if we can take care of ourselves as educators, uh, Zoya mentioned our Center for Learning and Teaching, that's where our faculty goes for various types of instruction pedagogically and as humans. And I am in charge of their weekly, the book club that we do about international pedagogy but also the weekly Wednesday workshop. Like last week, we talked about um, our Center for Academic uh, excess, success, excess, <laughs> that'd be nice, academic excess, I feel that sometimes, but um, <laughs> the week before we talked about the IRB process, and the week before we talked about pedagogy, but this week, I'm like, okay, we're well in the semester, let's talk about um, our mental health, so as I mentioned, we have a therapist coming to talk about, we are burned out as educators, our students are traumatized, we're all struggling, how can we do this more compassionately, you know, how can we consider, like, okay, um, I think many of us noticed when we went online that, okay, what are the SLOs? <laughs> let's consolidate, let's streamline, let's deliver things. So Zoya mentioned the 30 minute workshops, the same for short instructional videos. Those can go a long way when you aren't sure if you're gonna be online or in person or this or that. And in our research that we did over the last year, we noticed that across the nation, but especially with our students and our faculty, they want short videos. They want thir three minute or less. <laughs> 
um, things that can help with instruction. So just noticing those things as educators and as librarians, helping the faculty, providing support, um, and then being like, the compassionate listeners that Zoya mentions, those are some best practices because we can direct people not just to resources for their research paper, but hey, you are a great student. And I think someone mentioned early in the chat, they, they acknowledge their students and they present for like, I'm so proud of you. You're so brave to do this. You're, you're courageous. You're great. I love that. We're acknowledging that we are all coming from a place of trauma, many of us, you know. Um, I, lo I love that too. So with that idea in mind, you're smart, you're brilliant. We're going to get you there with the paper, but do can I, can I direct you to a couple services on campus? So we have this academic center for success over here that they can help you with these types of things. And we have accommodations over here and we have our counseling department over here. Let's take care of you um, compassionately and I'll work with you. I'll talk to your professor, you know, and, and of course we, we'd love to do that all that one-on-one -on -one with our students and it's impossible, but there are ways that we can have workshops where more than one person we can reach and we can do that digitally or in person uh, permit if you know campus rules permitting state rules guidelines permitting um, so with that idea uh, we wanted to look at a little a bit of discussion here on what you folks are doing so we'll go back to the google form um, and if you don't have that link let me grab it for you again um, and we want to know part of our affirming discussion here if you didn't get a chance to fill out the second question that's what we want to look at here um and maybe discuss for just a little bit so um I'll, I'll be quiet for two minutes it's hard for me but i think another thing that we're learning in our faculty uh, book club that i'm i'm heading up on zoom right now it's a great resource that was published in 2021 each chapter is by very diverse authors talking about things and we talked about silent learners the problem with silent learners there it is good has got it right there and, and spoiler alert, there's not a problem with our silent learners. This is the way we think of and view them, especially if we're thinking through a, a lens of the pandemic, you know, how students might be conditioned now to be more of a Zoom, not as active participant with their screen off and, and they're not used to in-person engagement and, and what are different ways we can do this. So anyway, allowing for silence in our, in our time together is important for people to reflect because we are different neurologically now because of the pandemic. So I am going to honor that and for two minutes be quiet while you reflect and maybe fill out that form. Um, yes, I would be happy to share. I'll type that title in the chat while you guys uh, are doing the doing the Zoom. In fact, we have it actually in our work cited. <laughs> yeah, we have it in our work cited, but I'll put it here too in the chat. One more minute on the um, reflect and share. Okay, and while you're finishing the last thought, a great way to allow for our pandemic traumatized to participate more and to get back into the learning process is acknowledging the different ways that they've participated through discussion boards and things like that are still very valid, even if they might be sick of it. It might actually work better for to engage our uh, different types of learners and something else that's worked well, of course, is a pair share. So we're just going to do we don't have a ton of time, so we're just going to do a short one. Um, and so I'm sorry, I hope it's not a frustrating exercise, but we're just going to do five minutes um, and that's fast. 
So you, maybe only one of you will get a chance to talk, but hopefully at least two, three, you know, real quick. Um, I'm gonna just assign um, a bunch of breakout rooms here. And so just go, uh, if you're having trouble on a Mac, you just have to hover over the name of the room. If you're, if, it might just automatically send you though, but and it will send you there. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. Um, and you can just be quiet too in that situation. If you prefer to have your camera off and not share, that's okay too. And we'll just do that quickly. Okay. And then we'll bring you back. It's gonna be fast. It's a great question, someone asked. Okay, let's see. Here we go. Recorded. Now we're seeing everyone back. Hi guys, welcome back. I know that was super fast, <laughs> but I wish we had a long time because I know we all have a lot to support each other with here. <laughs> um, so some things that I was seeing and that and hearing um, would be, you know, what is your library doing to address the pinnacle? Someone said nothing, not much that I can tell. I'm trying to be empathetic, but no changes beyond that. We offer a number of services online curbside delivery attempted to provide services as best we can however it's not been targeted efforts for underrepresented students a couple more is inviting counseling to hold drop-in appointments in our library i think that's so great um, compiling on and off campus resources to post online and distribute leaving table cards with call number areas for reading on mental health issues and coping strategies that's amazing so yeah let's do that um, <laughs> um, doing our best to reinforce uh, quiet spaces looking to create sensory spaces um, and providing services in many ways as possible at their comfort levels. So there's there's a lot of good things here of personal greetings for screening and sign in, um, you know, acting normal, but trying to get the students back to some sort of normalcy while still maintaining the safety and wellness of everyone is really all we can do. Um, I noted here in the chat that there was something about um, open by appointment only for some of us still, and um, and partly because of COVID, partly because of low staffing. And I noticed low staffing in, in a few of the comments. Absolutely. Um, we are a very small campus, and so everyone, but we have a ton of students too, not as many as most of you, I'm sure, but, but the point is, is that everyone's expected to wear many, many hats. And so all these great initiatives and things that we would like to do, we could work ourselves to the bone night and day and maybe get some of them done, you know? And so it is tricky and you have to consolidate. And so you have to really think, okay, what am I noticing? Um, and where can we best put our efforts at this point? And once that's a strong skill for us, then we move to our next goal. Um, but in here they said, have others had their virtual and in-person because they're seeing, um, have others had their virtual or in-person reference and instruction numbers pick up after moving away from remote? How did you actively encourage that or did that just happen? Um, I think that's a really good question. Um, Zoya, have you noticed our instruction and reference um, in-person numbers picking up after moving away from remote? Um, yes. And what but do we've, you think? We've changed it where we will require them to uh, do the tutorials first, the online tutorials first. And when they come in the room, it's just a lab. Um, so we're not teaching any concepts or any, well, we, we can um, review with them, but we'll, it's a working time. When they come in, we're, all we're doing is working on what they need to accomplish for the assignment. Yeah, I think a benefit of having them be more adept at the digital skills because of on online learning means that it allows for, um, us to create, I've just talked to Niche Academy about using their services to create decks of like different types of information and modules that students can go through. And you can do this with any, any type of um, software or program, but um, looking at things so that they can do the short and keep it short. Cause we have tutorials that are just like too long and we're learning, we need to chunk those now, right? Cause the, the pandemic learners, they need the shorter first. <laughs> um, so, so I'm looking at creating those things that we can streamline and okay, everyone look at this thing digitally and then come in for this, this workshop or these questions because, um, because yeah, it's different now and that's how you can kind of allow for the uncertainty of are we going to go back online Are we? and then you have those digital things available that can serve um, lots of people. Um, April, I believe, uh, so I, on our slides, did we have one more slide? Can you pull that up? Um, was there, there was another question on here too that I wanted to. There was the question about 
Um, have you worked with your social work department on trauma informed care? Yes. So um, there was this great TikTok I was going to put in our slides, um, but I love I love this guy. He's a he's a science professor um, that does dances with his students in the lab. You've probably all seen it, <laughs> um, but he had a very serious one that was talking about the very real statistics of our students right now um, having either like one in five, I believe, suicidal ideation um, and or attempts, you know, as well, um, unfortunately. And that's that's common in a higher learning anyway, but particularly now it's a real huge problem. And so we have had our psychology department at our faculty meeting do trainings and then they offer. And so we direct people to these resources to do um, at once a week. There's a, a suicide prevention training for students and staff and faculty that you can go to and attend um, actual verbiage that you are trained to say. And then, of course, our faculty workshop today at noon, our time is going to be um, someone from the social work department talking about academic burnout and taking care of ourselves as educators so that we can better take care of our students and model that for them as well. So I think that's we, really important. Sorry, Stephanie. And we want and uh, uh, what the library can do is um, offer the space um here because we have a classroom upstairs and offer the space for them to come in for the, our counseling services to come in and be in the library um to uh for their mindfulness activities or to do those workshops yeah yeah i agree i think that um when i first got hired and when i was like applying for this job and doing presentations to hopefully be hired the thing I kept coming back to that I noticed our library was excited about was being in, in our roles, being a bridge, being the connector, you know, bringing in those resources. It's a good place for all the conversations to come together and not just be in our different silos where our counseling department is trying to get out their message, you know, through their PR channels and our academic center for success is trying to get out their message through their channels. We can collaborate a little bit better with our social media accounts, with our um, emails, you know, just to support each other um oh i love the suggestion of getting therapy dogs not just because i'm a huge dog person but also because i know that um a, an article that i'm having that i have coming out in uh, a journal next month about social media and academic libraries throughout the pandemic i saw that uh one of the one of the schools that we looked at with the 10 schools um was alaska fairbanks and they had a dog they had their pets and their instagram things like that and then there's other schools i know that have brought the dogs in in um my mentor for new member roundtables in Maryland. Um, they at Hoover Library, they bring um, at Daniels College, they've brought in dogs. Um, if you can, I think that's great. I think anything we can do right now to support um, our faculty and our students, because when we're taking care of ourselves, our message today is really like, let's stop and breathe. That's why we took time. We had a lot to share and a lot of information. But we wanted to take time first to breathe because we knew you were all coming from places, going places after this, have a lot on your mind. We wanted to just take that time. So um, I know that people need to go soon. Um, I want to just uh, share that we're available for connecting on this at any time. Zoya, did you want to share something before we go? Uh, yes, Laura, I think, um, sorry if I got your name wrong. Laura asked if we can share. Yes, we will share the. Um, the uh, reflect and share and the questions and the answers. Um, I You can email us and we can send it to you. I'll we'll also send it to April. And, and I'll send it yeah. through with the recordings and everything else. So. Yeah. Fantastic. We'd love to connect with you all um, on this. We're all in this together. Um, and, and there's more to come, future directions. We want to have Creative Commons licensed things um, that we can share as well because um, we're, we're figuring it out together and we thank you for sharing with us today. So I have one more question. This sure. is my personal question. So how are your library staff handling the trauma needs of students while dealing with their own trauma? You know, we have staff who've had family members die from COVID, who have children that are doing virtual learning. And so they're having all these challenges on top of the challenge of meeting the needs of students, which are taking more time and more resources. Right. I, I found myself being my same strict self with our student workers the other day. I said, why is this person? They didn't come. They didn't do this. They did that. And so I was like, well, that person lost their stepmom. And then I'm like, 
okay. You know, we just all need to take a minute and breathe. And our library director the other day said, if you are sick, if this is that, like, we want you, we want you at work, but not if you're sick, not, a, you know, he made these like concessions. He said, the library will go on. You know, I think that's the thing as a life, as information professionals, we're used to performing at this level, having the answers, showing up, helping. And sometimes we need to realize that it will be okay. You know, if we need to take a minute to tend to that need and we need to model that for people too. I've seen a great email signature that I want to borrow from someone that says, if you get this email and you are not at work for me, please do not feel like you need to respond right now. Did we talk about this in one of the workshops I for think this? That's my email signature. Is that yours? <laughs> if I'm going to steal it, I'm going to borrow it. Um, <laughs> I <can> steal it. <laughs> but I, I love yeah. that sort of thing. Can we allow that for each other, that grace and that space to like get through this together because things will be okay. It will go on. So yeah. We go, we go out to lunch with our, with each other. <laughs> yeah. And just, um just talk stories and <laughs> and enjoy yeah yeah and we we we're all surviving a pandemic if we're here that is a that is a, a thing to celebrate right now um and so we need to like realize it's okay to go and take that lunch um our women's group on campus women in academia has a walking group now twice a week if you can come come if you just want to sit in the ac of the walking area that we're going to be in sit you know um make space for each other and and celebrate that we're all still here and dealing with something show up for people if you can if you can't don't hold that in model your healthy mental health uh help seeking behaviors that we're talking about today yourself by saying you know what i'm going to need to take a day um i've allowed for this to be here and the, you know um be responsible with your responsibilities of course but but i think that just acknowledging that we're human and getting through this together is really important. And thank you. Well, we we are time. officially out of time. So thank you, everyone, especially those who are still here. Um, this was really great. And this was excellent. So thank you very much for taking your time out, both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. And if you will send me the bibliography, your reading list, and the results, I will share them with all of our registrants. Thank you. We will. Yeah, we'll probably share with you our presentation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, our, yeah. 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 Send me everything. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest yeah. of your day. You too. Uh, happy Valentine's.